Evoke Media, I'm Sabrina Mirage Naim. With me is Cassia Binkowski, and this is Breaking Glass, a series of conversations with women around the world who are shattering glass ceilings and challenging social norms. They are audacious, gutsy, and their stories are echoed across borders and generations in a rallying cry that is changing the narrative for women everywhere. It's nearly impossible to give a proper introduction for Pat Mitchell without it turning into a novel, but we will do our best. We head to Atlanta today to speak with truly one of the most impactful women in the media world, Pat Mitchell. In the early 1970s, Pat was a single mother in New York City who was underqualified and overeducated for a career in media. Through perseverance and taking some big risks, she eventually landed a position at NBC. And over the course of three decades thereafter, she went on to build a distinguished career as the first woman to lead PBS, CNN, produce the first national program hosted by a woman telling the stories of women. She has won Emmys, Peabody's, and been nominated for Academy Awards. Sabrina, the focus of our discussion with Pat was how she used her career and platforms to further the stories and voices of women at a time when it wasn't encouraged or popular. She took huge risks and pushed up against a deeply patriarchal system to open the door for more women in media, and it shows. Today, that shows up in her work as the co-founder and curator of TED Women, her book, Becoming a Dangerous Woman, and the daily work that she's doing to cultivate a network of women supporting other women. This lady is a legend. Take a listen. Pat, you've made a career of telling the stories of women, and it's really a truly incredible honor for us to get to turn the tables on you. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for this invitation, Sabrina. Absolutely. It's our honor. Um, You are an author, a producer, a media executive, the co-founder of... Uh, and curator of TED Women, and on and on and on. But before any of that, you were a divorced single mother, and I'd like to start the story there, if you don't mind. Take us back to 1971. You had just moved to New York City, and you were working for Look Magazine. What happened over the next year? I had left a secure profession of, of college teaching, and with a small son, accepted an invitation to become a writer at a big city magazine, uh, Look, which at the time was one of the big news magazines. So exciting, uh, unprepared in many ways for moving to New York City as a single mom and face all those challenges, but loving every minute of this new life and feeling somewhat unprepared as we often do and Um, That imposter syndrome had already kicked in for me uh, as I sat in that look office with all those talented, experienced writers, and I was doing my first article ever for uh, a magazine like that. And in the middle of it, well, actually, I had finished the writing, but in the middle of the publication process for it, Look Magazine declared bankruptcy. And I was in New York City, unemployed with practically no severance pay because I'd only been working there for a little under a year and about to have my first big headline authored article in Look Magazine. And the news came to me in a telephone call that morning and said, I don't know how to tell you this, but you're unemployed. And as I looked around realizing I had gotten the news first, that my colleagues still didn't seem to know, I made a note that the person telling me that was a television reporter. So the next several months were incredibly anxiety producing, interview after interview, um, never being exactly right for the job, underexperienced and overeducated for everything. Uh, with a master's degree and all, you know, I just kept hearing the same things over and over. No, no, no. Um, But I was determined to explore the area of media further since I had fallen in love with writing. So I took the story that I had written for Look, I bought it back with my meager severance pay and took it to NBC 
where a friend did manage to get me an appointment with the news director who let me sit outside his office all day long. And finally, when he saw me, he said, what are you doing here? You have no television experience. You've never even studied journalism in college or an English major. What are you doing here? And I shoved the story across the table and he looked at it and he said, can you, can you report this story about Chinese gang wars? And of course I said, yes, as women often do without knowing fully what yes meant, but knowing that if I didn't say yes, that door would close again. And I'd heard plenty of no's and the yes was what I was waiting for. So I, I said, yes, sure, of course I can. No idea what that meant, but I did with the help of some very supportive colleagues, went back to Chinatown, got those same people to talk to me on camera and my report went out on NBC News that evening. Um, everyone congratulated me. <laughs> You've got a new job. You've got a new career. The rest of us are still looking uh, on the streets for jobs. But of course, none of that was true. I had uh, gotten lucky and was in the right place at the right time when he needed that story and I had the contacts and had done the research. But he didn't hire me. Uh, the same news director who let me, as he said, let me do that piece, um, told me, go find a small town somewhere. Learn the business. You don't start in New York City. But I was in New York. I had a son in school. I had a, mo a lease on an apartment. I, didn't, I couldn't just run and go find a small town somewhere. So where'd you go from there? A waitress at night to uh, pay the bills and the rent. And I, I interviewed every time I saw a job opening at any television station, radio station, newspaper, anything to do with media. And finally, after a quick freelance job with a mayoral uh, presidential campaign, uh, the mayor of New York was running for president and I volunteered and did some commercials for him. As a result, that introduced me to a station in Boston, the NBC station. They called and said, we'll hire you as a producer of a political talk show. Um, you're too old to be considered to go on the air. I was 26, by the way. And, and, you, and you have a child and we don't hire mothers with children. This was 19, the end of 71, 72. You could say those things and they did. Uh, and worse than saying them, they practiced them. They didn't hire women with children, and they did think 26 was too old to go in front of the camera. Anyway, that turned out to be a great opportunity. The station did a whole lot of programming. I got to make documentaries, ho eventually host a daytime talk show, and immediately uh, organized the women in the station to um, start to advocate for more women uh, in positions that made decisions. And that was the beginning of a long media career in which I like to think I used every opportunity, every position to further elevate the stories and ideas of women. And I, and I think that you certainly have, and you've been credited with that over the decades, but I want to highlight something that you said earlier on, which was that you were lucky you were at the right place at the right time for that story, which I actually have to challenge a little bit because you say that you had the foresight to buy back your story, to go to this guy at NBC, to put it in front of him, even though he didn't want to take you seriously. You had, even at that point, with very little experience, a gumption and a gutsiness that forced you into an uncomfortable position, whereas others maybe wouldn't have taken that opportunity. So that's not just the right place at the right time. That's a personality trait. You're absolutely right. And thank you for correcting me because I do that all the time with people as well. When they say, oh, well, I just got lucky. My grandfather had a great saying that there is no such thing in the world as luck. It's just being prepared for the opportunity. 